so glad to have Mark here tonight to help clarify some of these uh, uh, issues, some of them confusing, some of them basic about uh, our water. That's the source of our water. I want to, we will, uh, Mark is going to give his presentation and then we'll have time afterwards for Q&A. Uh, we try never to go over two hours in our forums because we know everybody has work in the morning or things to do in the morning. But we will have uh, refreshments in the other room and time for conversation. There's coffee out there, cookies. If you need a restroom, there are restrooms. There's one at the back of the social hall here that's wheelchair accessible, and then there are two at this end of the building. We have at that end of the room uh, sign-up sheets if you want to be on our ongoing listserv. And then in the other room, Mark's brought a whole host of information about programs and information from the DEP of Pennsylvania. Uh, Mark Stevens is a licensed professional geologist from the Pennsylvania uh, DEP. He has over 20 years of diverse professional experience related to water resource exploration and protection, permitting, hydrogeological studies, environmental investigations, land reclamation, waste disposal, environmental site assessments, groundwater water modeling, groundwater and soil reclamation projects, source water protection plan development and project management. So we're so lucky uh, that Mike Mark has made the trip tonight to answer our questions and to help us understand our water system here locally. Please give him a, a really warm welcome. Thank you very much, Darcy. It's so unusual for me to have such a glowing recommendation. Usually uh, when someone says that I'm uh, if you have a person from the department or from the government, they usually never, ever expect the news. <laughs> or do they ever expect anything ever to come out of it? So um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I, um, I'm familiar with Sarah. I'm familiar with Athens. I had uh, several different remediation cases whenever I was uh, in the environmental cleanup program. So uh, I'm going to get right to it. Let me fix the projector. I think everybody can probably hear me too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I talk so much better when I, I, I don't have to walk around. I'm going to pass out a, um, a bunch of brochures to everybody. Uh, everybody take one. This, this sort of uh, is a little bit of uh, information about source water protection that everybody can look at. So uh, since I, I like to wander around a little bit, uh, we'll start. start. Uh, source water protection is a uh, it's, a, it's a fairly new topic uh, with the department. It, it, it stemmed out of the Environmental Protection Agency. Now, back in 19, uh, 1993, the requirement that the EPA required that all state agencies develop a source water protection strategy. The source water protection strategy, we're all familiar with the term wellhead protection. Wellhead protection was sort of only exclusive to groundwater supply, to the well supply. But uh, there are some communities that use surface water as uh, water supply, and some use springs as water supply, and some just collect rainwater as water supply. So it's, it's, it, they changed the term from wellhead protection to source water protection so that we can get that broad gamut of information about a source. Uh, it all begins with the water cycle. We understand. That unless, unless we live next to the ocean or we live next to Lake Erie, just about all of our water that we get comes out of the sky. Any other water that we would get would be too high in what we call total all solids or too high in minerals to be able to consume or use. We couldn't bathe with it, we couldn't wash with it, it would be, it would be, it would be too loaded with, with minerals from the geology. So our water cycle begins in the sky as clouds generated by the sun falls to the earth and then replenishes our aquifers. So the question becomes, where does drinking water come from? As I mentioned, it, it, we have surface water supplies and we have groundwater supplies. The important thing is with, with all the supplies, we need to be able to protect those supplies for future generations. Municipal water suppliers are the, are, are the main people that supply water. Whenever Darcy had sent me a bunch of questions, uh, she asked one of the questions where, well, where does our water come from? And uh, through the EPA strategy to try to be preventative and proactive as opposed to reactive, 
the, the desire to try to encourage water suppliers. And, and we, we, when we mention water suppliers or water purveyors, we're really talking about anybody that can supply water to any more than two, to, to 15 people, uh, to, to 15 households. And that, that's a pretty small group. Some of our very small communities uh, can be that small. So there's a lot of water suppliers. Um, there are a lot of residential water supplies, which source water protection can certainly apply to those. But I, I in my latest uh, adventure with the department um, for the last 17 years, I've been encouraging water suppliers to think preventatively and proactively so that we can understand where our water supplies come from. Surface water supplies with reservoirs, groundwater supplies with springs become the general sources. And there's a lot of different sources. Um, I see the light is a little light in here. Um, we can probably see the, the screen a little better if we turn the lights down. Um, that's no problem. The uh, variety of different water sources, whether they're the river or, or the spring, uh, the BCI spring is over in Far Clearfield County. A lot of people are familiar with Belfont, the Belfont Creek Spring. Snowshoe water supply is on top of the mountain, facing uh, it is on top of the Allegheny Ridge, and then of course Pine Creek, very famous water supply. It all begins with where does water come from? I mean, how does water? How, how do we get water out of the ground? And this is an example of how water flows through ground. I, I once had an engineer told me that I don't know why you're a hydrogeologist because water can't go through solid rock. Ever seen water go through a rock? You pick up a rock, it doesn't have any water in it. Of course, I, I laughingly told him he didn't understand a thing about nature. <laughs> so there are a variety of different aquifers. Now, an aquifer is any material that can supply sufficient quantities of water for us to, to use. And in Pennsylvania, we have a variety of different um, aquifers. For instance, the sand and gravel aquifer, which is in the, um, in, for the water supply that supplies uh, Athens. And, and SARE is, uh, is what we call an unconsolidated sand and gravel aquifer. It utilizes the river and uses the sand and gravel as a natural filter to draw water from the river into the, into the wells. Then we have um, solution channels. If you're out in the State College area or you're out in a lot of different parts of the, uh, of the Ridge and Valley section, you'll find, um, you'll find solution channels in limestone. Fractured shale, fractured Sandstone, if we travel very far from the river, we'll find uh, what we call classics. They're, they're made up of, of larger units of sedimentary rock. They're laid down over, uh, over billions of years. And through tectonic forces, through the changes in the earth, uh, those, there's individual fractures that exist, which allow water to flow through solid rock. And of course, mine pools. If you get out in Clearfield County, you'll find a lot of mine pools. Now, of course, this becomes a little bit more interesting whenever you're thinking about the water flow falling out of the air. How, does, how do we get it back out of the ground? And for anybody to really protect water, we have to understand where water's coming from. Anybody that's been involved with environmental regulations or as an environmental scientist or geologist or engineer realizes that somewhere along the line, one's going to have to demonstrate to either a, a judge or a jury or a court of law in a scientific manner to explain all the different building blocks that make groundwater or surface water potable or drinkable. And uh, this is an example of how water from the sky falls on the ground through several different, several different layers through the, the aerated soil zone. We were talking a little bit um, earlier about composting. And um, I'm reminded of what I thought of earlier as an undergraduate at Penn State that soil is really nothing more than a big compost heap. You're looking at years and years and years of decomposing soil and decomposing bedrock that have created a living, living filter. And that veneer is what protects our groundwater from contamination. We have a lot of different activities that exist on the earth. We have, we have animals, we have plants, and that decaying process can provide um, nutrients, and those nutrients, when in excess, can be toxic. Our soils are what prevent that from happening. But whenever we remove the soils and we expose the bedrock, we can, we can do some damage to the, to the water system because that living filter is no longer there. 
Now, this, is, this shows a depiction of how difficult it is for water to get through certain types of rock. Maybe a little difficult to see in the back. And this is a picture of, of a root zone, of how the water table can exist at depths in fractured rock, but in the root zone, there really isn't any water. So the roots really have to struggle to try to get water. As it turns out, trees are one of the best ways we can recharge our aquifers. I do a lot of presentations and a lot of teaching in, in the uh, elementary school and the public elementary school for the sheer purpose of realizing that these will be the people that take our place in the future. And for us to, for us to really have competent professionals replace us, we, we need to get them engaged in environmental thinking very early. And, and that, again, is a key understanding of, of where water comes from and where it goes. And I often tell students, did you ever wonder where, how water, what's the best way that you can get water in the ground? Uh, there's a lot, of, there's a very a lot of mountainous areas in, in the Pennsylvania. And uh, fortunately to us, they're, they're covered with trees. At least most of them are covered with trees. And I mentioned to the students, did you ever wonder how water gets in the ground at a tree, with a tree? Because after all, the leaves aren't on the trees all year round. There's a certain percentage of time. And I, I, I mentioned that if they were to stand out in the rain and they were to hold their arms up in the, up in the air and the, the rain was to hit their arms, uh, what would happen to that water? Would it just drip off of your arms or would it run down your body? Well, it turns out the study of forest hydrology teaches us the water not only runs down, flows from the twigs and down the branches and down the trunk, but also into the roots and into the fractured bedrock that exists on the top of the hills and on these slopes. So, we have the best opportunity to get water to the ground with our forested areas. Of course, you can imagine what happens whenever we cut down our forested areas, what would happen to our recharge. So planning and how we forest is an important component of protecting water. Of course, the other natural thing is how do we understand the natural environment to be able to protect it? There are certainly lakes and streams which we think are recharged by by our surrounding areas. And oftentimes, whenever you're trying to either enforce environmental regulations or trying to find a responsible party who may be responsible for contaminating the environment and they're brought to justice, one needs to understand how the natural environment exists, that we can have lakes and streams that actually have impervious material at the bottom of that water body that um, doesn't go through the bottom, that, that is essentially holding that water. So you could, we could have a water table that's far below the stream or the river, but not actually in the river. And then, of course, we have areas where sometimes we have water in the wintertime, but we don't have water in summertime. And you think to yourself, yeah, I had a good well. Suddenly the water's all gone because it's dry. Well, why does my neighbor seem to have water all the time? Well, that answer may be our our variegated, our, our layer cake type geology may have water at upper levels but not regional water tables. And of course, there's the valley settings. And then we have examples of the real environment. So understanding the environment is important. Understanding how pollution can move from one place to another in the environment. And, and it's something that's not real well known with, with um, a lot of the public is the understanding of what we call bedrock fractures or fracture traces. Bedrock fractures are places of weaknesses where erosion has taken advantage of, of the bedrock and have opened up areas to where water can move more rapidly from one place to another. They're, they're likened to pipes or raceways by which water can move. And unfortunately, many times we're not real careful about where we put some of our facilities to where if they're located on these weaknesses or these weak areas, we may find ourselves fast-tracking uh, from a pollution source to our water source. Interestingly enough, a lot of water supplies are located on fracture traces. In fact, it's a, it makes a difference whether in Pennsylvania we can grow in one spot and get absolutely boatloads of water, but move over 10 feet and get not, not get much more to fill it less. So these areas of weaknesses, this, this method of being able to use aerial photography to find these these areas of weakness in the subsurface sufficient to be able to drain more water, draw more water from the bedrock becomes an economic boost for a community that needs water for development. 
So the whole idea behind what is the source water protection plan or what is source water protection, um, for water systems, it's a voluntary effort. The Department of Environmental Protection um, is not a, a, a preventive and proactive agency. We write regulations, we issue permits with the intention that the permits be followed to the letter of the regulations. If that permittee fails to follow the regulations, then there are consequences. And that's whenever we take enforcement action. But a water system has a lot of problems. When you stop to think about it, a water system is an entity that goes on forever. It, it's like a municipality. It's like a, a government. It, it, it goes on from generation to generation. It never really ends. So a water system has to worry about all the different activities that encroach upon it. Because water systems don't own a whole lot of land. If water systems own a lot of land, then there would be no, no funding for cleaning the snow off the roads this morning. So they, they only really own where their intake is in the stream, or they really only own where the pipelines are located. They really only own where their, their well site is. So now they're dependent upon the general public to be responsible stewards of the environment sufficient to be able to protect the water system. Unfortunately, water systems are not that great at informing the public about all the different potential hazards that could adversely affect the water system. Of course, once some water systems are lucky. Right? For instance, the one in, in, in that the Paco PA runs here at Serre and, and uh, Athens, uh, they have to be in an area where it's it's pretty difficult to. Um, uh, to, to adversely affect the water system because so much of the water is coming out of the river. But that can't be damaged. If someone decides, oh, gee whiz, we need to dredge that river. Or maybe we, uh, maybe there's a flood that comes along and it scatters out the bottom and suddenly it allows legacy uh, contamination to come within the water system. The last thing the water system is interested in doing is getting a complaint from a water user or a customer saying, oh, my water tastes fine and then later find out that they have a severe problem. This picture over the right hand side of the glass of water, it's, those of you that in the back may not be able to see it, where it says motor oil and litter and yard waste and, and pet waste. That is a, a drawing that was developed by the Water Resource Education Network. Uh, it's a, a, a project of, women, of the legal women voters that uh, tried to bring into specific relief the importance of trying to protect the ground we stand on. Because the ground we stand on is the area in which some water supply is, is drawing its water. So all those different pollution sources all boil down to what it does it take to develop a source water protection plan. And you know, we focus on a lot of potential sources of contamination. We focus on gas well drilling. We focus on highways, stormwater, above ground needle storage tanks, uh, waste facilities, uh, backyard waste facilities septic systems. There's a lot of potential sources of contamination, but there's a method that water suppliers need to follow, whether that water supplier only serves 15 people or 300,000 people. There is a method by which they can follow in order to preventively and proactively come up with a strategy that can prevent water system failure. This is how it goes. It's a matter of following what we call a, a delineation. It's an, analytical, it's an analytical design by the department, by the Environmental Protection Agency that is, um, that is uh, uh, initiated and administered through the Department of Environmental Protection to develop a whether, regardless of whether the water system is a source, would be a well, or whether it would be a, a river system, a watershed, its ability to be able to identify all those areas so that a water system can, can provide surveillance or they can watch the areas that these, that these uh, lines show to be able to protect their water system. After all, the best people to protect the water system are the people that live there. It can't be someone in, in Williamsport. It can't be someone in Philadelphia that works for the EPA. It, it's got to be people that come from this area. And it's the people that come from the area that understand who lives there, what kind of activities are occurring, and they're probably the best people that can reverse any type of polluting trend 
may occur. So regardless of whether it's a, a well or whether it's a, a stream or surface water, we're looking at what we call a time of travel. How long does it take a particular contaminant to move from one place to another? That's all. Is that contaminant uh, discharged to the surface? Or is that contaminant uh, discharged to the subsurface? And it makes a difference because of all the different laws of dilution and dispersion and natural attenuation that we can have a 10 year time of travel if we have some contaminants or we can have a, uh, a rather rapid 25 hour time of travel or a 5 hour time of travel. Now the scary thing about groundwater contamination is whenever we start modeling these things through an analytical model, we're basing them upon contaminants that we have some knowledge of. Unfortunately, there are a lot of, a lot of chemicals that we use today that we don't know how they break down in the natural environment. So whenever I go to schools and I, and I talk to students about um, contamination, I try, to, I try to, to use an example, especially in the environmental cleanup program, where, where I was actively involved as a project manager trying to figure out how contamination can be cleaned up, is that let's, let's imagine that, and let's step back in time to you're about three or four, maybe five years old, seven years old, eight years old, and uh, you come home from school and um, you're really hungry, so you decide you're going to get a, a glass of, of cherry pop. Now, if you're from Pittsburgh, like me, you call it pop. If you're from Philadelphia, you call it soda. And I apologize if those of you don't know what pop is. <laughs> but you get, a, but you get a, a big glass of cherry pop, and you get a big bowl of spaghetti. And boy, you're really hungry, and you decide, oh, it's now, in my case, it would have been Holly Duty. Or it could have been some other show I wanted to watch. And uh, you decide to watch in front of the TV, and you guess what happened? You're sitting on your, you know, your family's white rug, and you spill everything. Now, you have two choices. You can either go call mom and say, Mom, guess what? I made a mess. We need some renews it. Let's clean this thing up. Or you can park the television over. And you can tell everybody this is our new design for furniture in the living room. And you know, they're all going to humor you because you're only five or six years old and you're showing a little bit, little bit of insanity. Well, it just turns out until the ants start showing up, everything is fine. But whenever the ants start showing up and it starts to smell, that's whenever people realize there's something wrong, you move the television and, and, and there's, you know, not only does the carpet be replaced, but so does the padding and the, and, and the subflooring and it's probably leaked down into the downstairs and, and you got a major reconstruction project here. Well, environmental cleanup program is sort of the same thing. If, if, if there's a spill that occurs somewhere in these zones, this 10 year time of travel or it is five or 10, 25 or 25 hour time of travel, we get that cleaned up right away, we can reverse or prevent any type of contamination. But whenever we leave it go, and we let it dissolve into the groundwater, we let it move with the groundwater, that's whenever one day someone's going to call up a water supplier, and hey, my water tastes funny, they'll run out and they'll do some testing and they'll say, oh my God, we're contaminated with a carcinogen. And believe it or not, this has happened more than once. So that's why I get pretty passionate about telling the story about the, the cherry pop and the spaghetti. Not that I would know anything about it. <laughs> but that it's, it's important that we realize that there are areas that contribute to our water system that need to be protected. And it's not that we can't drink this, the cherry pop. And it's not that we can't eat the, the uh, spaghetti on the white rug in front of the television watching our favorite television show. Um, what we need to do is we need to take special precautions to make that protection, that a form of protection, as stringent as possible. So if we do spill, we spill on something else, like a TV tray, mm -hmm. or like maybe a, a piece of plastic or something else, so that Plutz Mark would fall, would drop it on something else, and it wouldn't be on a white rug. And, that, and I'll get to that whole reasoning in the future. But source water protection sort of is like this. And I call this the land before development slide. Where this is the way it was before we started building houses, we started building factories, we started putting underground storage tanks in the, in the ground. Where we, we had a little bit of agriculture and we had two different types of aquifers. We have the surface water aquifer and we have the groundwater aquifer. And this would be the bedrock aquifer. 
And this shallow aquifer, that's probably the, the, the simplest form of information, simplest form of aquifer that we have for, um, for sair. Sometimes we have some confining layers here, which would be this brown layer, that would protect the water that is deep from contamination from the surface. Okay? Remember, the soil has a lot of bacteria. And of course, the, the source water protection zones that we talked about would be this 100-foot circle and this 10-year this time of travel followed by the water set. Now, this, this very diligent water system, they found a nice pristine place. Maybe there were, all there was really going on was a little bit of agriculture. And you know, when I was a kid on a farm, whenever we spread manure, it was in a dry form. But nowadays, agribusiness spreads manure to where it's liquefied. Maybe because it's a whole lot easier to use a, move a whole lot more and discharge a whole lot more. Because after all, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you don't really like to do. I mean, I had to do it, but it's not one of my favorite chores. But anyway, let me shut this off here. Yeah. Uh, so as we continue our story, what happens? Housing development. We have an underground storage tank, gas station, city area. We have a we have a uh, golf course, we've got a bunch of septic systems, and then we have a water system that's been merrily going along this way. Now remember, the water system only owns the land directly at the well. They don't own anything else. They don't want to own anything else because after all, that's where their taxpayer money is coming from. So it becomes a little bit more complicated for water systems to try to protect this 10-year time travel when you've got houses parked over. So it all begins with how do we plan? You know, planning is always the key. Try to figure out how can municipalities try to, to encourage people to build in certain areas, work in certain areas, and, and leave some of these forested areas. Remember, the forested areas have the trees. Remember an example about standing out in the rain and water running down your body, and of course, your, your, your tree, your feet are bedded in the ground, and, the ground's fractured because it's up on top of the hill. The soils are thinnest there. So water's getting in here. But you have other activities. You have agriculture right next to your reservoir. You have a town in the valley, of course, but then you've got a strip mine up here. And of course, you have some industry right next to a stream. And we have these yellow marks. These are places where we monitor to see you know, where we can find water in the future to check out what's going on. So, so this, this slide was. You know, planning for source water protection. Protection are these risky ramblings or or harmless happenings? Are these things that are not really a problem? Would we see agriculture as no problem? Is there a way that agriculture can exist in this area and not be adversely affecting the water supply? Because after all, if this water supply reservoir suddenly fails, then I guess we have a problem. We have a thirsty community that now has contaminated water. So my whole job is looking into the future. It's trying to get communities to sort of be proactive. It all begins with understanding geology. A lot of people say, oh my god, I can give you some science here. Well, this is, this is a geologic map that shows all the geologic formations that are naked. We strip off all the soil, and we're looking at just the bedrock. And of course, we're way up here in Bradford County, you know. Really looking kind of kind of dull up there. And this is one of my tools that I use. This is a geologic map. One of the questions that Darcy asked was, uh, what knowledge do we have of existing wells? And this is where we get most of our knowledge. This is the Pennsylvania Geologic Survey, geologic resources report is available online. Uh, <coughs> exactly. This particular one, I don't think is on my yet. They haven't gotten around. I think we must have had a, a state cutback or something because <laughs> it hasn't been it hasn't been um, a scanned in. I scanned this in for my own report. But what this does is this gives a listing back in 1983. Larry Taylor, who's now with the Susquehanna River Basin Commission, but was at this particular time with the, the um, Pennsylvania Geologic Survey, they developed these, this very elaborate mapping to understand the geology. And what this report also had in was all the known water supply wells, whether they were residential wells, community wells, that uh, existed in this area based upon the different geology. And of course, the problem was sort of where you are is, is we got, you know, we got two different geologic surveys that exist in two different parts depending on where the river flows. 
So we have the East Branch and we have the West Branch. And of course, it's a very colorful map, and I don't expect you to really define it. It's like, oh, what's that little orange right there? But uh, I tell you that we, we've got some pretty nice geology sufficient to give us some water. And this is an example of the Bradford County water supply data that's available that was done back in 1983. And you notice there's a lot of private names here. There's, so let's see, there's Archer, there's Desmond, there's Harney, there's Fry. Those are all people that their wells were identified based upon their depth, their water quality, the amount of water that was discharged. That's what we work on. Now that was done back in 1983. Unfortunately, if unless a water supplier does a source water protection plan for their area, they may not necessarily attain this type of data because this is this is very important data that documents water quality and quantity and the geologic aquifers and the elevations uh, based upon a snapshot in time. And that's really what we're dealing with is how many snapshots in time of data can we gather sufficient to be able to make a movie, really a lifetime of a water supply source or an aquifer. So this is a this is a very detailed study. Unfortunately, this is it. We're looking at all the documented wells for that water resources report for the West Branch and Susquehanna River. There's also another batch from the East Branch. I didn't want to belabor the point. Uh, so where are we in source water protection? Well, on the left hand side, there's about oh, 20 or so water systems. They're seen as little red dots throughout here that are public water supplies. And unfortunately, for Bradford County, we only have two water systems that have had the foresight to be able to develop source water protection plans. And those are Tawanda and Camp. The only two. Very important sources, uh, one of which is uh, bordering on jeopardy uh, of contamination, and one is in pretty good shape. But, but that's it. So, you know, a lot of people wonder, gee whiz, you've got a big county, you've got a big thirsty county, uh, how come this county hasn't been more active in source water protection? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, the only person that really sells source water protection is me. And if I've got 14 counties, plus I also help with another 14 counties, it becomes a little bit more difficult for me to try to get around every year. So every opportunity that I get to talk about source water protection and to talk about uh, geology and some of the, the subjects I'm pretty passionate about, of course, I take. So whenever Darcy had asked me about uh, coming up to talk to uh, everybody about source water protection, I started drooling. I passed out because somebody actually asked me to do this. <laughs> After I came to, I, um, I, I, I then asked for permission from my superiors. And of course, talking to, to groups is not a problem for the department. It's just, uh, for the administration, it's just, what are you going to say? <laughs> We're going to let this wild geologist go up there and talk about it. But um, we have all these no plans here, and that's my goal, is to try to get all of these water systems with some sort of an idea of where their water is generated, and to try to come up with a plan for them to protect their water. So after a while, if we've got an area here, and an area here, and an area here, 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 we not only know where our water is coming from, we also know where to look for water. So if, for instance, county planning looks at this and says, oh my God, we've got this, 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 and this. We're, what kind of industry do we have? Well, we may see this pockmark with gas wells. We may see a pockmark with underground storage tanks and communities. There may not be a whole lot left. And ideally, we wouldn't necessarily want to depend on surface water for everything because it could have its pit, pitfalls too. Ideally, we would like to have a nice pristine area up in the middle of nowhere that's covered by trees, sufficient to be able to determine what our water quality is going to be, not only for today, but for the future. And that's what I oftentimes I tell students. I said, you know, some of the contaminants we have in the ground today, um, if we were to spill them today, some of the contaminants take such a long time to naturally break down. And it takes such a long time to disperse, and, they, and they're pretty stubborn. I mean, some of the contaminated cases that I started on 17 years ago are still as contaminated, but yet millions of dollars have been spent on them to try to remediate them. So I, I tell the students to say, well, you know, imagine spilling something today. Sure, it's an accident. It's contaminated the water. Nobody drinks the water. 
Imagine having that resource lost, not for today, not for your children, or your children's children, or your children's children, or your children's children after that, because they're all carcinogens. So nobody can drink the water, we condemn the water source. How many times can we tolerate that before you don't have any more left? So the only water we have is coming out of the sky. And who knows how long that'll be. So we need to understand where our water is coming from in order for us to protect it, because it'll be this documentation that actually supports us in a variety of different discussions, whether we're discussing a new facility to be placed somewhere, or we're discussing a facility that exists that we would like to, say, improve their housekeeping, or maybe we would like to reduce the risk of any activity. Because after all, risk management is just a fancy word for reducing risk to a tolerable level. We need to reduce the risk so that we can live with it. Because everything we do is risky. Driving on I-80 can be risky. Putting your seatbelt on would improve your, reduce your risks of survival of a crash. But driving down the road without a seatbelt is certainly going to increase your risk. So we need to figure out protective measures so we don't say no to an activity. All we need to do is say, how can we build whatever facility we're going to place on this ground sufficient so that it's going to be the best facility and it's going to lower our risks of contamination. Now this is a, this is a cartoon, a depiction, uh, a caricature of the geology of the Athens-Serre, the Aqua PA water plant. So where we have a variety of different water coming into the ground. It's, it's drawn out of these sediments here, and it's, uh, it, it, it's sediments that have been, been worked a lot. You know, there's been glaciers, there's been water changes, the river has, has moved back and forth over the years. Uh, but we have water that comes in from the bedrock, we have water that comes from the surface, we have water that comes in between uh, these, these, what we call these cane terraces or cane moraines. And uh, we have this, we have all this, we have all this, this water. I mean, it's a big bathtub. There's lots of water. It's one of the few sources that you can't even meter. There's so much water down there. So it's nice to think you've got all that water there. Uh, at this point, you should like to be able to protect it. So um, this is a... You know, let's, let's sort of explore a little bit. Let's take a little tour of the county. And it's going to be a short tour because we only have two water systems that have source water protection plants. <laughs> this is Canton. Those of you familiar, not familiar with Canton, this is Route 14. Route 413 hands, heads off towards the east and 14 continues. And this red zone here, that's their 10-year time of travel. And you'll notice how close it is to the roadway. And there, there are these three little dots here. Those are their wells. So was it wise for them to put their three wells right next to Route 414? And I don't know if you've been in Troy, or I don't know if you've been in Camp lately, but it is, I, I used to zip through Troy, I used to be able to zip through Camp in about two minutes. Mm -hmm. Now it takes me half hour yeah. to come north on 14 and sit in traffic all the way back here because we got 40-foot trailers that are backed up all the way through here trying to make it through town. Mm -hmm. And to make matters worse, they have a water filling station for the trucks right there. Now, I got a hand at the Les Hill figure. The giant water supplier I know that can charge $14 a thousand, $16 a thousand for water and get it. Right? He's managed to pay off all of his Penvest loans that he used in order to repipe the entire water system. This guy lost half of the water he ever pumped before he replaced all the lines. Now he's down to maybe a mere 5% leakage, which is phenomenal for a water system. So that's their water supply. And, and you know, whenever you say less, less, you know, we got to look for new water out here, out here, out here, out here. And of course he says, well, I'm okay. Yeah, you're okay, but maybe you got to reconsider a little bit. And then this is Tawana. Now, remember I mentioned Tawanda. Well, here's their water supplies up here, right against the river. And the reason why I said they're in pretty good shape is because they draw from the river, the Susquehanna River, but they're up in this really nice upgrading of this residential section, section, section of town. And meanwhile, the town's down here, but their water system is way out here. Yeah, there's a few gas tanks here, underground storage tanks that they need to worry about, but in their zone two, they got a lot of development. They could probably use a little retrofit of maybe water, moving their water system somewhere else where it's not going to be a problem. But the water systems, they got so much to worry about. 
you know, they've got, is this line leaking? Is this customer complaining about dirty water? Do we have to tap a new new facility here? Uh, maybe let's worry about um, something else today. Or let's worry about this tomorrow. So their water system, they have these source water protection plans. That's that 10 year time of travel, the zone two, and of course this is their watershed. And they need to be worried about all these different activities, whether they're their graveyards, whether their airports, this is another one of their wells, this is south of town. But even though they put the well south of town, they have problems with nitrogen. Because of all the legacy farming activity, we build up with a lot of nitrogen in the water, where because they're so far away from the river, they're so much more dependent on water that resides in the ground. And of course, we're applying manure on the ground. Yeah, we need manure to grow crops, and yeah, we need to do a lot of things in order to make our economy strong, you know, but we're pretty close to a Conroe rail line. Somewhere along the line, our, our ideas of how we develop water systems has to be changed to let's put them in the best place so that we can protect the water through our preventive proactive strategies. And of course, here's another one. This is a spring, and, and this is so, so well protected, there's really nothing around it. It's just a spring dry up in the, spring, in, in the summertime. So getting back to, this is the water supply for one of the questions Darcy asked was public water supply. So this is the water supply for your area. And there are basically three wells, wells 8, 19, and 20. And they're whopping 88, 93, and 43 feet deep. But they can manage to move a lot of water. They move 1,500 gallons a minute, 2,000 gallons a minute, a thousand gallons a minute. That's a lot of water. That's over a million gallons a day. And it's a thirsty community. They don't even use them all at once. And they use this one, they'll use this one, they'll use one, this back and forth. And their water level is pretty, pretty high. So there's there's 30 feet there. So really, uh, when you're looking at the you know the uh, the total depth of the of, wa of of the well is 88 feet and you're pumping 30 feet, you really only got about 58 feet of water that you're pulling from. It's amazing that you're pumping so much water. But that's, that's, that's the water supply. Three wells handles a thirsty community. And um, whenever we do an assessment, and then somebody had asked the difference between what's an assessment and what's a source water protection plan. An assessment is a snapshot of what the water sources are as far as, 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 as their recharge area, and their, um, and their risks. But there's nothing in there about suggestions for how to protect the water supply. You know, it's the past, the general description of the water system, the present, oh, this is where the water's coming from, and this is the pollution sources, and, but there's nothing in the future. But a source water protection plan puts us into the future. What can you do proactively to protect your source for your children's children, children, children's children? Remember, we're going on in perpetuity. So you've got land uses, you've got water bodies, low development, high development, pasture, property, coniferous forest, uh, 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 mixed forest, deciduous forest, emerging wetlands, transition lands, and unpaved roads. Some are zero percent, some are pretty high, 61 percent, um, some are cropland, 323 <laughs> percent. So if we're thinking to ourselves, let's see, what do we put on the ground to make food? As I tell the students in the school, let's see, what's on a what's on a farmland? Everybody's falling asleep here. So let me ask, what's on a, what would we put on farmland? Anybody? Crops. For fertilizer, right? What else do we put on farmland? Pesticides. Pesticides. What else? Herbicides. Herbicides. So we have pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer, and there's one more pollutant. The trout hate, fish hate. What do you think it is? Lime. Uh, I'm sorry? Lime. Fire? Lime. Lime? Lime. Lime? No, no, trout love lime. What do you think it would be? Anybody been on a hot parking lot on a hot oh, summer day? I'm sorry? Asphalt. No. Car? No. no. Thermal pollution. Um. Water running from our barren fields, water from our, uh, well, there's another one too, it's sediment. Uh, running, running off, flowing off of our, our uh, sediment, off, off of our parking lots, our rooftops. All that goes into a stormwater collection system and it's directly discharged or 
It's terrible not only for, and then of course sediment. Sediment is one of the three biggest pollutants in the Susquehanna River, the Chesapeake Bay. It's causing the, chest, the, the, the death of the Chesapeake Bay, the other two are nitrogen and phosphorus. You know, so those have issues that are in our power to be able to protect. For instance, taking a lot of stormwater and discharging into the ground, putting it into the ground, not so fast that it disappears, but slow enough so if there is any pollutants on the surface like petroleum hydrocarbons, the sunlight will break down that complex carbohydrate, which is part of that, that, petrol, that petroleum hydrocarbon, and then what goes into the ground is pretty clean water. So if you think of all those pollutants that we're putting on our agricultural lands, how are we ever going to avoid them being in our water? So that's some of my worries to keep up. Uh, and of course, if we're looking at what geology is going on here, this is a geologic drawing that shows, that, and I don't know if you can see it, I just want to show, but we just want you to appreciate how complicated some of this stuff can be. Uh, these are really bedrock elevations based upon if we were to take all the soil off and all the water off of, of what's going on as far as how water is flowing from one place to another in order to get into the river and get into the wells. And it's interesting that we have this, this, this high here that it's, it's sort of like a, an underground mump and water sort of sheds its way off, but there isn't a whole lot of recharge going on here. So this is just one of the tools that are used in that assessment to determine this drawing. And this is the drawing that everybody's concerned about. These are the well locations for the, uh, the water system, for the consumer, Susquehanna, this would come right out of the assessment. And these are these source water protection zones that show a five hour time of resident. I'm sorry, this is a 20, this is a, I'm sorry, a five hour time of travel from this line to the edge of the stream. That means in five hours, if something spills, it's in the river. Now there's a time of transport it takes to get from this part of the Shimon River to get down to the creek. And there is a time of travel that it takes to get from this portion all the way down this river. But I'll tell you what, it's not very long. It may be a matter of another three, four hours. So this water system really has to be concerned about not only this, this zone one, which is a 400 foot circle right around here, but they also have to worry about all, these, all this river going on here. Now, because they're in this island, and because they're they're pretty isolated by the geologic sediments that have been deposited over years and years and years. Um, they're in pretty good shape. But, you know, none of us have crystal balls, and none of us have x-ray eyes, and none of us can be able to understand everything about everything. So we do have risks associated with this water system, and they're plotted here as little triangles. Now, this was a snapshot that was done back in 1983. What we need is a, a more definitive, more accurate, more rigorous study of the water system. And that's what my program does. I, 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 I manage a program for the North Central Region um, that is what we call the Source Water Protection Technical Assistance Program. It comes up with funding that can do these type of studies that has already been dedicated by the US EPA for that type of work because, of course, they've mandated source water protection as a requirement for all states. And I would seem to be a little bit more aggressive though because I have 52 water systems, well, next month I'll have 54 water systems in my region that have source water, approved source water protection plans. There's less than 200 in the entire state. So it just kind of shows you how, how aggressive I am to find, find a reason to protect water. So again, we're talking about what is fate and transport this is just a sort of little review, the process of, of discussing and improving and distributing of chemical compounds. That's the contaminant. The fate is how long it's going to get to us, and the transport is where, when, and how it's going to get there. Of course, no, no presentation is complete without a discussion about the bad stuff. I mean, I have to have you go home and not be able to sleep at night just like me. <laughs> For instance, industrial fluids. We have those, what we call, light non-aqueous solution or, or fluids that, that float, uh, like gasoline, kerosene, diesel, but then they dissolve. A lot of people think that they, they don't dissolve. Well, they do. They dissolve in the benzene, and benzene is carcinogen. It's got 
one of the more sensitive. It's, it's got a, a concentration, a lethal concentration of five micrograms per liter per eight hour exposure. So it's not something that you want to have for, for breakfast. Actually, one of the students, I asked one of the students um, about all the different chemicals that you put on, on the land to grow crops. And when I get down, I says, does anybody, does any, does any student here want to drink that for dinner? Does anybody want to eat that for dinner? They say, no, well, they have to wonder why we put it on the ground. When we know that the water flowing through the ground takes this stuff and puts it in our groundwater. So somewhere along the line, we have a disconnect of information here. Agricultural chemicals, weed killers, silage, all silage is horrible. Oh, I can tell you that about silage. Um, cleaning solvents, such as the dense stuff. Those are the, those are the really the bad ones. Those are the ones that are denser than water, and they sink to the lowest part of the geologic formation, and they just stay there. They don't ever go anywhere. They may spread out a little bit, but they never change in concentration. And the concentration for TCE is one microgram per liter. Anybody know what one part per billion is? One gallon per one billion of one other gallon. I mean, it's, it's, it's a drop in a swimming hole. It's, it's very toxic. And of course, we're, we're worried about the mixers and the floaters, and, and those are all kind of things. And of course, this is a depiction of the different floaters and the different sinkers. And uh, earlier we were talking about New York State, um, about how there was a gentleman here from New York State. My wife, she's from uh, uh, Hilton, New York, a little town outside of uh, Rochester. And I was amazed the amount of gas stations that are not do not have tanks buried in New York State. Somewhere along the line, somebody must have decided it was a bad thing to put a tank with hazardous material in the ground, particularly when you don't know where the water's going. So somewhere along the line, we got to get out of this mentality of putting tanks in the ground and maybe putting a tank in a tank. So if the tank spills, it goes somewhere else and we can recover. These, uh, these sinkers, they're a nasty bunch. And um, if we go there, we'll never get home. So anyway, getting back to our little community, this is what's happened. And this is a true story. This is exactly what happened. This community had, had pollution from everywhere. They had... They had septic systems that hadn't been maintained in so long they were failing. I mean, you've seen that ad for the, for the stuff to put your toilet to break, break down the bugs. Well, they had backyards that were just emitting huge amounts of phosphorus and nitrogen and antibiotics. And the, the, we, had a manure spot, uh, we had a manure spill where they had a, a 5,000 gallon tank and the guy got stuck in the mud all the way up to the axle. So what was the logical thing to do? Let out all that 30,000 pounds of, of manure onto the ground so we can pull that trailer out of there. And that's what they did. We have the leaky underground storage tank, gasoline. We had golf courses. A lot of people don't think that golf courses are a pollution source. But <laughs> golf courses, very interesting. They're designed to be containment structures because whenever you hit a ball, and I, I've never golfed, I've just watched golf. But, and my father-in-law tried to show me how to golf one time, but fortunately it didn't work out. Uh, you hit a ball and you're anticipating the ball to, to go and roll where you want it to go. It wouldn't do well with a golf course if you hit the ball and it went plop and it just stopped there. So golf courses are made so that the soil are compacted. They're also made so that the water doesn't sink in the ground. That it just keeps the grass alive for that day. So they're constantly draining the water off of the golf course every time they water it. They take the water out of those water hazards and they pump it right back onto the, right back onto the, the, the greens and the fairways. And the only place that's not compacted is the woods. So all, a lot of times, a lot of those nutrients run off into the woods on either side. And of course, remember I told you about the deep rooted trees? Well, the trees are loving it, but they can only drink so much. So a lot of that goes right past the roots, goes right in the ground. And of course, we have a thirsty community that no longer can uh, use their water because they have so many pollution, pollution sources. It, it, you just can't, you can't, hit, you can't miss one. So, and what's, um, and what's the name of that community? We're not going to give that name, community. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's 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 on its road to recovery. Um, but anyway, uh, we we're talking about geologic hazards. We we're talking about pollution sources. Uh, and I always get the question: Well, how do gas wells work? How do a water well? How do oil wells work? Well, gas wells and oil wells take advantage of natural, natural structures in the ground that collect 
these, these materials that collect those fluids and those gases sufficient to be able to recover them. So they use the natural traps, whether they be inclined since oil and gas, gas is lighter than oil, and all gas is originated from organic material, whether it's oil that's trapped in shale, or whether it's free-flowing oil, <coughs> excuse me, oil. They use these traps, whether they're an anticline, in this case, whether they're a blind trap, whether they're a, a subducted anticline, where you've got two on each side, or whether they're a fault. So they use this ge ge geoseismic studies to be able to identify these different sources. And of course, this comes from my, my professor, Dr. Schlegelin at Penn State. Um, this is the best way to understand how they got there in the first place. You know, I get a lot of questions from students. How did shale get all the way down there? Well, this is an outline of, of Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania was once a shallow sea, but where the mountains were really where New Jersey is now. And there was a lot of organic material that was sloughing off into the sea. And of course, the deeper the water, the, the more, the, the finer the grain, the sediment. So the deeper the water, we get limestone. We get, we get water that's not quite so deep. We get shale. We get shallow marine, which is a combination of sand. And as you get closer to the continent, you get bigger and bigger coarse fragments or sand. So, the rocks. So we go from deep water to shallow water. So this is how all that material sort of, sort of originated. And of course, and then, you know, of course, no discussion is complete without asking, well, what about the Marcellus Shale? Well, it just so happens that, that Bradford County is, happens to be home to some of the thickest Marcellus Shale beds that exist, 250 foot thick. The only problem, as we mentioned before, is, is that uh, it's a possibility that because the price of gas has gone down, natural gas may not be in the hunt so much longer because it is dry gas and doesn't have a lot of the extra petroleum products that typically exist with natural gas. If you're from Pittsburgh where I live down here in Westmoreland County, oftentimes you had a tank sitting right beside the natural gas well because as it burped, it brought up petroleum products. So that, those petroleum products are very valuable because they're already partially refined. In fact, aviation fuel is one of the, one of the fluids called distillate that becomes very valuable because it's very expensive. It's a very light petroleum gasoline that they use for piston aircraft at high altitude. So uh, some of these pro uh, products now have become so much more valuable, so we have a lot of gas well joining according to the Marcellus Center at Penn State. A lot of the, my other my other professor, um, uh, Mike Boy, how I repressed his name. It right? must be that one test he gave me. Um, have now moved have now moved west. So we now have a rare opportunity to understand how gas wells are constructed and how we might be able to prepare for gas well drilling. Right now, remember that as I mentioned before, I don't believe in stopping any activity. I believe that any activity can be, can be uh, performed. We can have every facility, it's just we need to have that facility as safe as possible. And a lot of people don't understand the little intricacies of how a gas well is drilled and how a gas well is protected from surface water. And this is a drawing that I, that I made. I, I did this uh, for the Potter County Gas Task Force over two years ago to try to explain how geology works. You know, if you recall from that very second slide I showed you where we have the water cycle. We have water getting in the ground, it soaks in the ground, and we get it back out of the ground. Well, there's some water that never gets out of the ground. It gets in the ground and stays there. And I call that a stale aquifer, and that's when we got this un very unhappy face. It's a very unhappy aquifer. But we have fresh water, and you'll notice there's a happy face there, so that's a happy aquifer. So that's typically where we get our water. And this depth is usually between ground surface and in certain areas of the state, you can go down to four or five hundred feet, and that's about it. The northern tier, if you go much more than 150 feet, you have water that's so stale you can't drink it. It's got that high TDS concentration, you can't make suds with it, you can't shower with it, you can't drink it, you can't boil it, you can't do anything with it. All you can do is kill grass with it, that's all you can do. But anyway, these are all these different aquifers, and they're all they are all protected by what we call confining beds or shale. And this is a picture of a gas well up in the northern tier. And this is how they grout the well. They put cement 
down the center of the well and they allow the grout to flow up the sides of the well. Now this is a very different construction method than what a water supply well is. A water supply well is grouted not only with a little wider space between the casing and the hole drilled in the ground, <coughs> but it also is filled with a separate pipe that fills the grout from the bottom. So, so, and it's not filled as a one continuous process. And they, fill the, they fill that space with grout, and they come back the next day, and they measure how deep the grout is, and they keep filling it up until the regulations, chapter 109, the water supply regulations for the construction of water wells, say this is all filled up. And it's intended to protect the water from all those nasty soil contaminants that we have that want to try to work their way down through the ground. So, in a, in a perfect world, this would be a, a whole lot shorter for a water supply well. But if these gas wells were constructed as if they were water supply wells, we wouldn't maybe have so much problem. And this is, this is why some mistakes have happened with water supply wells, at least with some of the ones that I've investigated. Where the casing is not centered, and we don't get a total donut or envelope of grout around the casing. And what will end up happening is some of this unhappy aquifer water will sneak up into this, this happy aquifer water. And unfortunately, it's not a lot of this bad water that can get into the good water. I, I was doing an investigation in a town um, over in Tioga County to where a water supplier drilled 330 feet into the ground. And he wanted to try to get as much water as he could. He didn't, he didn't properly case the well. But what ended up happening was is the water commingled and 330 feet, believe it or not, is too deep. The deepest you can drill over in this town near the New York State border or over in Tioga County is 125 feet. After that, you start getting high concentrations of sodium and chloride and arsenic and, and, and barium and all the different things that your heart and your liver and your kidneys do not want. So um, we had to take an enforcement action in order to shut that well in. But it takes years for a well, for, a, for this happy aquifer to recover from this, this bad, nasty aquifer water. So all it takes is just a little bit of care to make sure that these zones are protected. And importantly, the, the newest oil and gas regulations are stipulating casing construction, which is going a tremendous distance in order to protecting water supply. So we're reducing the risks, although mistakes can still happen, we're reducing the risk by insisting that a lot of the wells are constructed like this as opposed to that way. And of course, we're near the end of the slides, and of course, no discussion is complete without the discussion of some more of those nasty contaminants, whether they're discharges from um, stormwater off of sediment area, there's this oil sheen off of parking lots, not to mention the oil and retention, but also uh, hot water. There's this manure spread on frozen ground next to next to this drainage. I took this picture just before we had a thunderstorm and all that rinsed right into the stream. And of course there's all these above ground hill sorry stains. For one year I had over a hundred spills. I had over a hundred uh, above ground hill sorry stain for these incidents. And unfortunately homeowners insurance do not cover such incidents. So they become the biggest one of the biggest disasters I've ever had to deal with is a water system. So how can a community water water system be protected from contamination, uh, the responsibility of local government, greater success through source water co coalitions, uh, which is my next subject, let me get to that. Before it gets too late, let me get through this. And um, let me get to this. These are, these are some of the tools for a water system to try to develop a what we call a source water protection strategy. There's what we call voluntary ex examples, which would be develop a public education tool, install water supply signs, promote hazardous waste collections, acquire sensitive land parcels, purchase conservation easements, support septic system management, encourage preservation of open space, update a detailed emergency response plan, encourage BMP implementation. But then there's what I call the nasty things, the develop mandatory overlay dis districts, require special permitting, require nutrient management plans of farmers, implement septic tank management programs, uh, prohibit certain septic systems, require building permits. Those are all municipal changes that require a lot of help. Well, my latest endeavor 
has been trying to develop a source water protection coalition for all the water systems that have developed source water protection plans. And so far, I have uh, four of them developed. One of them is the North Central Source Water Protection Alliance, which is a group of water systems in Lycoming County that felt it was their responsibility to not only protect their water system because they see themselves down at the neck of the funnel of the watershed, but to also enlist the help of all those water systems that are upgrading of them. So this, this North Central Source Water Protection Alliance has the potential to encompass not only Lycoming County, but also members from Sullivan County. Well, the Tioga County Source Water Protection Coalition is exactly what it is. It's all water suppliers in Tioga County. But the interesting about this NCSWPA is that they also entail municipal officials. So we have a couple of township municipal officials that are, that are also part of the members. One, the other one, the Triple Divide Watershed Coalition has an ideology very similar to uh, the North Central is that they see themselves at the head of three watersheds, the Susquehanna, the Allegheny, and the Genesee. So they feel a responsibility to make sure that all the land in which they are positioned stays as clean as possible because they know water runs down a hill. Mm -hmm. So they would certainly like to try to protect water for future generations and lands they own up. And then of course my buddy in the north, my counterpart in the southwestern region, the River Alert Information Network, they're composed of 23 water systems, and they go through active monitoring. They have monitoring systems that are more cost more than this, than this entire building to manage, and their whole purpose is to watch for a single contaminant floating down a river because they know their intake is in jeopardy at a second's notice. So they have automatic equipment that can not only measure the contaminant but can shut water intakes off that believe it up. So and that's pretty expensive technology. So and they they've gotten pretty organized. They developed their own brochures. This is for the Tioga one developed by the conservation district. This is the one similar to the one that um, that I showed you that I, I I passed out to everybody. This is the North Central Source Water Protection Alliance, and and county planning is involved with these, to where the county planners see it important to protect infrastructure sufficient to be able to continue the sustenance of the water of the, of the community, knowing that water is everything when it comes to protecting a community's health, that without water you've got a problem. So through all of these all of these different strategies, similar to that brochure I, I handed out to you, the intent is to try to send the message that we're all in this together and we need to all work together to be able to develop these preventive proactive strategies to uh, protect our water system in the future. And of course, that's the River Alert Information Network. If you dial up rain on the uh, information, oh, incidentally, the Triple Divide Watershed Coalition Park, and they just won the Governor's Award for Environmental Excellence, which I'm pretty proud of. But some of these preventative, proactive uh, strategies are far towards to try to educate the public in the importance of source water protection. Of course, there's me in the classroom. I wish they wouldn't have taken a picture. Um, we got people, there's, there's me also doing a presentation along stream bank fencing or stream bank protection in order to protect the water system. Of course, roadside. If you notice real close, PennDOT has a level on this, on this sign. Why someone would think that that thing wasn't level going 60 mile an hour down the road? But roadway signs for a little town in Montgomery um, to notify people, if you're thinking back to, to drinking cherry pop and eating spaghetti on the white rug. This informs people that if there's an accident Christmas Eve, that still gets cleaned up Christmas Eve. And these areas are, are reported, this is reported to the EMA, and they, they roll all the equipment necessary to remove that contaminant immediately before it can endanger a water system. And of course, best management practices is a, is a system that we tout to protect the recharge of the storm water in these buffer zones. If you remember that example of how can an agricultural um, activity or a facility exist in close proximity to a, a, water, a water supply or a reservoir? The answer is buffer zones. We have a buffer zone. We allow the nutrients running off of that land to get into this buffer zone, and they be attenuated through all the vegetation. That's the answer. Impervious services, um, they, they've got their own little issues, but uh, the restoration through, through planning.